What you're about to see is an imaginative glimpse into the future. A Hollywood view of the year 1960. We'll see some rather startling things, some of which may be commonplace by then. Here we go, to the city of the future. It's 1960, remember? And we're visiting the home of Mr. and Mrs. Ames, who might be your neighbors or mine. Hi, first. Hi, Danny. Hello, second. Hello, darling. Hey, Mom, I'm hungry. What have we got for dinner tonight? We're having sirloin steak broiled in butter. Steak, steak, steak. Every night the same thing. Can't we ever have anything else? Danny, my boy, you're lucky to get steak. Yeah. I remember back in 1944, we thought we were lucky to get any kind of meat. Isn't that right, Mother? Okay, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll get me one of those new Super P-1038 convertible rocket planes to fly to school, I'll eat anything you say. Danny, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You've got a lovely plane now. That old helicopter? That's no fun. Now, Danny, I told you before, we can't afford a rocket ship. Now, if I hear any more out of you, I'll ground you. Then you'll have to get along with an automobile. Okay, okay, I'll be good. Golly, if I had to start going around in an automobile, my girl would take one look and say, shoo, shoo, baby. Shoo, shoo, baby? Where in the world did you hear that? Well, one of those old programs we get on the reversoscope. Yeah, how'd it go? Shoo, shoo, shoo baby. Oh, yes, I remember shoo. <laughs> oh, my, my. I love those old songs. Yeah, see if you can find that program again, Danny. Okay. <laughs> shoo, shoo, baby. Papa's gone to the seven seas. <laughs> Let's see now, when was that popular? I think it was back in 1944, wasn't it, Mother? Yes, get 1944, Danny. All right, 1948, 47, 44, there we are. It's a little old-fashioned, Pop, but you asked for it. If you happen to see this trim little buggy zoom up and quickly swing into a tight parking spot, you'll be looking at a remarkable new car, the Davis three-wheeler. With four seated comfortably, it takes off. Streamlined as a plane is this unique creation with designer Gary Davis at the wheel. Built in Southern California, it logically incorporates several aircraft principles, such as adaptation of the tricycle landing gear system. A switch on the dashboard operates built-in hydraulic jacks and makes tire changing an exhilarating experience. The single front wheel explains the car's parking dexterity and keeps it on an even keel in the event of a blowout, even at a top speed of 115 miles an hour. There are no fenders, wrap-around steel bumpers protect removable body panels. This little chariot can really run you around in circles. What's the trouble, Gary? Uh-oh, a modern Frankenstein. And here's another streamlined marvel on wheels. It only needs a pair of wings to be at home in the sky. Formidable indeed is its nose. With riveted aluminum fuselage, entry hatch, and rugged empennage, it's wasting time on the ground. But being earthbound, the monster is trundled out onto the highway to frighten other motorists. If you're looking for a 1960 model, this may well be it. Somewhat less spectacular is this sporty new creation of Gordon Burig of Pennsylvania, designer of the famous Cord. Front fenders of laminated fiberglass turn with the wheels made of light magnesium. Body and removable top are of aluminum and plastic. In the cockpit, or rather the driver's compartment, Mr. Burig operates the controls, closely resembling those of a plane. Thus, aircraft methods are becoming increasingly popular in automotive science.
By golly, I think I'll buy a new car. And uh, say, Millie, how long have I had the old one? One year, eight months, 14 days, 11 minutes, 43 seconds. Three o'clock, boss. Time to go home. So it is. Well, I'm ready. Yeah, long day, 11 to 3, two hours for lunch, three days a week. It's a tough life. <laughs> Number WJK-412. I did three hearts. Three no trump. I pass. Do you mind if I pass? <laughs> Certainly not. Go right ahead. Thanks. <laughs> about it. This bus is a little old-fashioned. Well, that was delicious. concludes tonight's thrilling episode of our three-dimensional western, brought to you by Energade, the combination <laughs> soft drink, candy, and dessert with the three-dimensional flavor. Good, good, good. Buy it at your local market. Hello, folks. Say that. Now we are going to bring you a special entertainment feature which will show the development of the automobile. Oh, Pop! I want to see another cowboy picture. Quiet. I beg your pardon? Oh, n not you. <laughs> Say, those new models look terrific. They are terrific. You should see what your grandfather used to call an automobile. Okay, Sam, start the show. Now, folks, believe it or not, this is actually an automobile. When Grandpa was a 17-year-old hot rodder around the turn of the century, this job was the hottest thing on wheels. Grandpa's newfangled horseless carriage changed his whole life in more ways than one. Motoring was a thrilling experience even in those days. Since there weren't any doors in Grandpa's dreamboat, Sometimes it was a little too thrilling. Every trip was an adventure in those days, and one thing you could always depend on. A flat tire. The old retaining rings on the rims didn't always retain what they were supposed to retain. Shock absorbers hadn't been invented yet. And road conditions were ideal for testing the fatigue and failure points of automobiles and drivers. Grandpa's car didn't have much acceleration for passing, so he found himself on the wrong side of the road for longer than he should be. Caught out at night, Grandpa's gas or oil headlamps weren't much competition for a couple of fireflies. The little speedster had no top, and it was far from comfortable in an unexpected shower. The windshield was a great improvement. But without a wiper, even Grandpa's 20-20 vision couldn't keep him out of trouble. 
The runabout didn't have a self-starter, and often the 10-horsepower engine didn't respond to the hand crank. Occasionally, even on good roads, individual parts failed without warning. Axles snapped. When drag links and steering knuckles failed, it was hard to tell what might happen. With every passing year, improvements came thick and fast. Stronger and safer wheels were developed with demountable rims for tires. Doors were added to keep people safely inside. Tops became standard equipment. Windshields protected motorists from bugs and the elements. Wipers were invented to help the motorists drive safely in bad weather. The driver's seat was moved from right to left to make passing safer. The electric starter replaced the old hand crank. This remarkable invention enabled Grandma to get into the automobile driving act, and she really loved it. As the years went by, the automobile manufacturers continued to improve their cars and make them safer so that more and more people could use and enjoy them. Press steel wheels for greater strength, stoplights to warn following drivers, rear view mirrors, four-wheel hydraulic brakes to increase stopping power, bumpers to add more protection, rubber-covered pedals to keep feet from slipping, safety glass increased passenger protection tremendously, welded all-steel bodies and all-steel tops meant more strength and safety. Bumpy roads were smoothed out with shock absorbers, and Grandpa could sail along in comfort and safety. Through the years, the automobile changed from a novelty to a necessity. It created a new way of life. It provided a whole new concept of transportation for industry. And we became a nation on the move for work and pleasure. Besides designing better automobiles, the manufacturers developed research and testing techniques to help them build safer cars. The science of metallurgy met the challenge of creating more efficient and stronger parts and assemblies. Scientists used all kinds of technical equipment in research and development programs. Ingenious torture tests were designed to reveal fatigue and failure points in parts and assemblies. Like the parts and assemblies, the cars themselves were tested under all kinds of driving conditions to make sure that they would operate with maximum efficiency and safety. At the end of the rugged test run on the proving grounds, they were disassembled down to the last bolt and checked and studied in minute detail. Year after year, manufacturing processes steadily improved. To make sure that every automobile that left the factory was in good working order, each car was subjected to more than 2,000 inspections. Cars became safer and more reliable. So when Grandpa, still plenty spry in spite of his age, set out for a little trip, his car was reliable, safe, comfortable, and easy to drive. Safety door locks kept Grandpa secure inside the all-steel body. The adjustable seat quickly placed him in a comfortable position. The automatic transmission made driving easier. And easier controls meant safer driving. Styling contributed to safety. The low center of the gave more stability. Tubeless tires meant increased safety. New equipment kept Grandpa warm in the winter and cool in the summer to add to his comfort. And a more comfortable driver was a safer driver. More powerful and reliable engines were developed to make driving more efficient. When Grandpa passed another car, he did it safely and easily. Wraparound windshields and larger rear windows increased visibility tremendously. 
steel beam headlamps guided Grandpa safely at night. Power brakes made it possible for him to stop easily and quickly. Directional signals let the other fellow know the driver's intentions. Power steering not only made parking a breeze, it made all driving easier. Even in the good old days of the 1950s and 1960s, Grandpa could rely on his automobile to get him to his destination quickly, safely, and fresh as a daisy. So you see, folks, all of you who are living in the year 2000 are fortunate because through the years, the automobile manufacturers have had as their goal your safety first. They have constantly improved the quality and safety of automobiles. And they will continue in the future as they have in the past to create cars that are more maneuverable, more responsive, more dependable in every situation, and easier, more pleasant, and safer for all of us to drive, including, of course, Grandpa. That's the ding-dong truth, folks. Look at me going on 117. It's this easy modern living that does it. Well, so long, kids. Gotta go pick up another new model. You're watching Sleepcore Pleasant Dreams. My daughter Wendy said, Dad, you gotta see Jetsons the movie. It's cool. Now Wendy's has a fun way for your family to meet the Jetsons. Just order the Jet Pack, a delicious quarter pound single and a large drink, and we'll give you a free Jetsons the movie cup. I guess I'm just old fashioned. That George is my kind of guy. Come in for a Jet Pack and your free Jetsons the movie cup only at Wendy's. There's a lot of action over here. She's mopping up with a towel to get the water some of the dishes she dried a few minutes ago. That water in the pan is an awful messy looking sight, folks. I wish you could see it. It's a deadly and entire operation. The dishwasher will use a total of only 15 quarts of water, which is a lot less than Mrs. Drudge's use. Hurry, Mrs. Drudge, before it's too late. That water's coming out very fast. Too late. There's the last drop of water, folks. The contest is over in exactly 7 minutes and 58 seconds. In that time, Mrs. Modern has washed 50 dishes and 40 pieces of silverware. As I... Well, it's all over, Mrs. Drudge. You may as well rest now. <laughs> as I've said before, ladies and gentlemen, this contest is going to be scored on three counts. First, the time it takes to do the dishes. Unquestionably, Mrs. Modern wins on that score. Second, the cleanliness of the dishes. They are clean, they are dry, and sparkling. They will do honor to any woman's table, so Mrs. Modern wins point number two. Her dishes are certainly cleaner. And now, point number three the condition of the contestants. Mrs. Modern looks as fresh and neat as when she stepped into the ring. While Mrs. Drudge, well, I'll have to leave that to you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the winner, Mrs. Modern. Oh, what a beautiful kitchen. Neat, isn't it? Neat? Nothing. It's a paradise. This is the new electric dishwasher. That's key. Bud and Dad would sure go for it. They're the official dish dryers. Tom's going to get me a dishwasher like that for my birthday. It's the last thing he ever does. But, Mother, your birthday was last month. Well, I've just decided I'm going to have another. <laughs> Electro, come here. And here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, walking up to greet you under his own power. I present to you Electro, the Westinghouse Moto Man. You see, all I need to do is to speak into this phone, and Electro does exactly what I tell him to do, sometimes. But I don't see why I'm telling Electro's story when he's perfectly able to tell his own. So let's listen and see what Electro has to say to us today. All right, Electro, will you tell your story, please? Who? Me? Yes, you. Okay, toots. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'll be very glad to tell my story. I am a smart fellow, as I have a very fine brain. That's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. Boy, what a guard that guy'd make on my football team. <laughs> Now, Electro, a moment ago, you were bragging about uh, being able to count on your fingers. Do you remember that? Well, we're going to find out about that. Now, uh, do you remember how many children were born at the same time to a certain family up in Canada? Do you remember that? All right, let's see if you do. Count them on your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Well, that's absolutely correct. How can he do all those things, Jim? He's full of motors, gears, cans, and photoelectric cells. You could fill a book with all the electromechanical principles involved in the thing. All he lacks is a heart and a brain. If you ask me, I'd say he had nothing but brain. Well, then all he lacks is a heart. He's not the only one. The world that's there. There's father and mother and sister and brother. Thank you. 
The past is black and white. The first decades of this century are black and white. My own childhood is black and white. I look again and again at pictures, snapshots, movies like these, and my earliest memories seem to lose the color they contain and to become like these images. I remember the year in which the world began to change. The year when not all at once, but scene by scene, color began to replace the black and white world of my early childhood. I first heard about the New York World's Fair a long time before it opened. I heard about it in the newsreels. You often saw strange things in the newsreels then. One week it was this man, Grover Whalen, president of the New York World's Fair Corporation. And what he was doing was preparing to bury that streamlined bomb sort of thing deep in the ground of Flushing Meadow where it was to lie unopened for 5,000 years. The contents of the time capsule will give a much truer picture of American civilization than we have of the peoples of 5,000 years ago who were unable to preserve for posterity the record of their aims, inventions, and accomplishments. It was the time capsule of the Westinghouse Company, and it was the first time capsule I had ever heard of. They were putting in scientific texts and books reduced onto microfilm and messages from our time written by Thomas Mann and Albert Einstein. There were radio programs and records and comics, daily newspapers, copies of Life and a dozen other magazines. There was a Lily Dashay hat, a telephone, a pack of camels, a baseball, and a golf tee. There were eyeglasses, a clock, a Cupid doll, a slide rule and a light bulb, a menu from Childs, a dollar and change. Well, that would be a must-see item, the time capsule in its immortal well. Watching it being buried, you knew these people were serious about the future. 5,000 years. 5,000 years. Sleep Corps will return after these messages. Famous fashion designers in the U.S. today have been asked to forecast what Eve will look like in A.D. 2000. One idea is a dress that can be adapted for morning, afternoon or evening. It's the sleeves what does it. According to another artist, one dress of the future will consist of transparent net. The net uh, probably to catch the males. Apparently in A.D. 2000 we shall be having a hair-raising time. Yet another designer goes so far as to believe that skirts will disappear entirely. Shoes will have cantilever heels, and an electric belt will adapt the body to climatic changes. The lightly clad woman of tomorrow, ooh, swish, will move in an atmosphere that's scientifically kept at the right temperature. The future bride in a wedding dress of glass. What the groom will wear, apart from a worried look, isn't mentioned. A dress of aluminium, with a sash to change it for afternoon or evening and an electric headlight to help her to find an honest man. As for him, if he matters at all, there won't be any shaving, collars, ties or pockets. He'll be fitted with a telephone, a radio 
and containers for coins, keys, and candy for cuties. Even in the year 3000, the question will be, what's for dinner? The answer will be in a package that saves energy, nutrients, and trouble. A package that can last the three-year journey to Jupiter and back and back. Even in the year 3000, we see the brilliance of food in cans. The first big pavilion to go up was Russia's marble-clad tower. Dominated by a statue everyone would call Joe the Worker. Selling Stalin on the fair was Whalen's first big coup. It guaranteed that his fair would be designated the World's Fair for 1939. This is the New York World's Fair as it will look in 1939. Every time Whelan signed up a foreign nation or a big American corporation, a model of its proposed pavilion would be placed within the gigantic model of the whole fairgrounds, high up in the Empire State Building. And those fairgrounds had begun to look like no place on earth. As soon as plans for a World's Fair had been announced, the foremost industrial designers, modernist architects, and social planners in America had seized on it as their great chance. They urged Whelan's Board of Governors to downplay the backward look, the patriotic anniversary that had been the usual excuse for a trade fair in the past. <laughs> In fact, the board had already hit on just such an anniversary to celebrate. 1939 would be the 150th anniversary of George Washington's inauguration in New York City. So Whelan brought George to town. He even drew a crowd. Out on the fairgrounds, an immense statue of him by James Earl Fraser was erected and the whole fair would be nominally dedicated to him. But in the end, George and the past would be dwarfed by the future, by the fair's symbol and center, the Trilon and Perisphere. Because that wasn't a pyramid or an obelisk or anything old-fashioned going up out in Queens. It was a Trilon. The official theme of the World's Fair was to be building the world of tomorrow. And inside that immense globe, only it wasn't a globe, it was a perisphere, was constructed a scale model of a centrally planned city of tomorrow, democracy, city. The sort of place where all Americans would soon be living. City planners and functionalist architects believe they knew what the future had to be like and what ordinary Americans had to learn to live successfully in it. They intended to make a working model of tomorrow in Flushing Meadow and they convinced Grover Whelan to go out and sell their tomorrow to the world. Thank you very much. Congratulations <laughs> and every good wish for success. Every good wish to you. Sir. Thank you. As opening day grew closer, Whelan acquired as many public events for his fair's uses as he could. When Howard Hughes made his record-breaking flight around the world, Whelan got him to paint the Trilon and Paris Fair on the plane and deliver invitations to the fair in Japan and China. Show that feedback, Tony. They landed! Yay! Whelan got his fare into the newsreels and on the air as often as he could. And he was always ready for a second take. They landed! Hooray! I 
$155 million wonderland. As if by magic, 1,216 acres of wasteland have been transformed into the most stupendous exposition the world has ever known. Hundreds of huge buildings, thousands of exhibits comprise the greatest peacetime project ever undertaken. The planners and builders have woven well the threads of the titanic tapestry into the eighth wonder of the world. Franklin Roosevelt's opening day speech was covered by every newsreel, but it was also, for the first time, broadcast by the medium of tomorrow. All who come to this World's Fair in New York will receive the heartiest of welcome. They will find that the eyes of the United States are fixed on the future. Yes, our wagon is still hitched to a star. But it is a star of friendship, a star of international goodwill, and above all, a star of peace. I hereby dedicate the World's Fair, the New York World's Fair of 1939 and I declare it open to all mankind. It cost 75 cents to get in, not cheap, and a guidebook cost a quarter. If you could spend $5, you could get a guided tour, including tickets to all the big shows and dinner. You could spend days seeing everything, and it could be you'd never want to go home again. Kansas What the designers had hoped to do was to structure your experience of the future from the moment you entered the gates. From the various entrances, converging avenues drew you to the theme center, the only buildings at the fair allowed to be painted stark white. Stretching away from the theme center, each avenue was a different color, pale pastel shading subtly to deeper hues in the distance. A color-coded city, bright, rational, completely planned. Coming down from the perisphere on that ramp, only it wasn't a ramp, it was a helicline, the first zone you glimpsed was the transportation zone, over across the bridge of wheels. There was the aviation building, like a dirigible entering a hangar the double prows of the marine transportation building. There, Ford cars endlessly circled the road of tomorrow. And there, inside the immense General Motors building, the one with the longest lines, was the one exhibit everyone knew about, the Futurama. That was what I wanted to see first. I loved that fair. It was so clean. 
Dad said we'd come not just to have fun, but to learn, to get ready for the future. So we bought a guidebook that explained it all. And we chose the transportation zone to start learning in. Only on the way to one exhibit, you were always being caught up by others, all bright, all beckoning. Railroads are on parade in a super roundhouse largest exhibition building in the fairground. Here, the story of the Iron Horse is portrayed in a historical pageant presented four times daily. Every show, every exhibit pulled you into the future. Golden Spike, marking completion of the transcontinental route in 1869. You were continually being shown improvements in progress. 1789, 1939, 2039. Always greater ease, efficiency, frictionless speed. Climax, the arrival of the train of today and tomorrow. The Streamliner Deluxe. All aboard. But the whole real future was in the Futurama. I waited for hours on the switchback lines at the General Motors building, inching my way towards the future, thinking about tomorrow. Actually, tomorrow scared me a little. Could I grasp the immense plan expressed in occult symbols all over the fair? Would I be up to tomorrow? It seemed so urgent that tomorrow be dragged out of the future where it lay, peacefully unborn. But why was it so urgent? Why? Looking back now, I can see why. And if I had seen this film at the fair, where it was first shown, I might have understood a little then. We hoped for so much from the future because our present seemed so empty. Don't tell us that this is the best that you can do in building cities. Who built this place? What put us here? And how do we get out again? We're asking, just asking. The depression that began in 1929 had never really lifted. Here we were, a mighty nation, our industrial plant intact, our people strong and willing, and millions living on charity or on the streets. Everything shabby, worn out, stalled. Thinking men and women, the Institute of Planners, which made this film, believe that the waste, the frustration, the killing poverty were worse than evil. They were unnecessary. They believe we could rebuild our fallen system so that it served people instead of consuming them. All it would take was informed, democratic assent to central planning and a willingness to shake off the past. It's here, the new city, ready to serve a better age. You and your children, the choice is yours. Actually, this was the new planned town of Greenbelt, Maryland. It looked like the future. But what the planners insisted, what the whole fair was always saying, was that this is possible today. you entered the General Motors Futurama through a narrow cleft in that high wall. And you were put into a moving chair and a voice began to speak with calm certainty and before you opened a wonderland. 3,000 square miles in scale, 
a plane ride over an America from which the past, my present, had vanished, seemingly without a trace. And now we see a great river city of 1960. Here is an American city replanned around a highly developed modern traffic system. On all express city thoroughfares, the rights of way have been so rooted as to displace outmoded business sections and undesirable slum areas whenever possible. A vast circular airport is close to the city with a giant dirigible hangar so that it can be turned easily to meet any wind direction, it is resting in a pool of liquid. Here is a highway intersection, highway engineering at its most spectacular. By means of the ramped loops, cars may make right and left turns at rates of speed up to 50 miles per hour. Safe distance between cars is maintained by automatic radio control. Curved sides assist the driver in keeping his car within the proper lane under all circumstances. A quarter of a mile high skyscraper's tower. On many of the buildings are landing decks for helicopters and auto gyros. We see some suggestion of the things to come. A world with a future in which all of us are tremendously interested. Because that is where we are going to spend the rest of our lives. It was Democracy City and Greenbelt all stitched together with the super highways General Motors was counting on. And whether or not the Futurama was exactly what the social planners had in mind for America, General Motors had no doubts. When you left the building, you were given a small blue and white button that said simply, I have seen the future. You're watching Sleep Core, media for insomnia. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness the most excitingly different new concept in the history of television. Whoa, 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 whoa. We are looking at 1965. It's TV today from the world of tomorrow. They call it predictor. The picture just floats in the air. The so predictor. The picture can turn anywhere. The so predictor. No picture could ever compare with the so predictor. The so predictor. The so predictor. Good evening. I'm Nelson Case. Well, what do you think? Is there any wonder it's called the most advanced television of our time? And the credit all belongs to Philco television scientists who have worked years to develop a radically new semi-flat picture tube which measures less from front to back than any you've ever seen. They've created a new Predicta chassis, which puts more picture power in less space. And for the first time in television history, they've discovered a way to separate the tube from the chassis. Now, all this makes possible a new approach to the design, use, and enjoyment of television receivers as we know them. Here's another example of that result. The Philco Predicta pedestal a completely new console TV, exciting and different. It's truly TV today from the world of tomorrow. But there's more. There's so much more that you haven't seen or even dreamed of. So be sure to stay tuned in for your first preview look at the most exciting television line in the world. Just a sample of what's in store for you right now at your Philco dealers, where it's 1965 today.
atomic age was born. There is no denying that since that moment, the shadow of the atom bomb has been across all our lives. All men of goodwill earnestly hope that a realistic control of atomic weapons can and will be achieved. Meanwhile, good sense requires that all of us prepare for any eventuality. But wisdom demands, too, that we take time to understand this force. Because here, in fact, is the answer to a dream as old as man himself. A giant of limitless power at man's command. And where was it science found that giant? In the atom, a particle so infinitely small that it takes over a hundred billion billion atoms to make up the head of a pin. Just as other millions and quadrillions of atoms are the tiny building blocks which make up everything in the world. Ships and shoes and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. Although no one has ever seen an atom, scientists have learned a great deal about how they behave and there are widely accepted theories as to what they're like. Let's start by meeting a leading authority on the subject, Dr. Atom. Now, observing the professor himself, we can see that his structure resembles, in many ways, something almost as vast as the atom is small, the solar system. And there are certain similarities. Here is the center with electrons in surrounding orbits. But whereas the planet's movement trons is slightly different, there are other differences too. Hey, hold it! Thank you. Now, the solar system together is electrical. The electrons, which are negative, are attracted by the protons, which are positive, and vice versa. But here in the nucleus are other particles with no electrical charge, called neutrons. Very important characters too, as we shall see. And equally important when it comes to atomic energy is what scientists call the atom's binding force. It's a kind of cosmic glue holding the nucleus together. This then is a single atom, but certainly not all atoms are alike. There are in nature more than 90 basic elements, which is science term for families of atoms. To scientists, the atoms of the individual atom families, or elements, are identified by number, that is, the number of protons, or positive charges, in their nucleus. And they vary all the way from hydrogen, which has just one proton, to oxygen, with eight protons, to gold, he's rich with 79, Finally, on to the heaviest of all natural elements, uranium, with 92 protons. Now, within each element, or family of atoms, there can be different members, each one having the same number of protons, but differing in the number of neutrons. The total of an atom's protons and neutrons is its atomic weight. Thus, in natural uranium, we have U-234, U-235, and U-238. These different members of the same element or atom family, science calls isotopes. Some elements, tin for instance, have a great many isotopes. Others, like aluminum, are lone wolves with just one. Now, most atoms of most elements are content with their lot in life. We speak of them as being stable, but others are busy day and night, being what science calls radioactive. Like radium, throwing off powerful rays along with some of its neutrons and protons, until it actually alters its own nuclear structure. And changes to another family. And then to another, until it does become stable at last. This spontaneous changing of elements is called natural transmutation. Its discovery gave men of science an idea. If an atom could change itself, why couldn't man change an atom? Using as bullets the very particles which radium threw off, a noted British scientist bombarded nitrogen and converted it to oxygen. In terms of individual atoms, this is what happened. 
The radium nucleus threw off an alpha particle consisting of two protons and two neutrons. One of the protons was absorbed into the nitrogen nucleus, turning it to oxygen. This was artificial transmutation, man changing the elements. From that first experiment, others by the thousands followed as scientists devised ever more powerful particle accelerators, commonly called atom smashers, to transmute more and more kinds of atoms, all scientifically important but hardly world-shaking. Then, in 1939, some scientists were experimenting with transmutation of uranium. What would happen, they wondered, if they fired a neutron at a uranium nucleus, already the heaviest in nature. Why not try? So they tried. And the result? Nuclear fission. Instead of a minor change, the atom split in two. Truly a discovery to change the world. For what had happened when the uranium atom split was a kind of double miracle of science. Half of the miracle concerned that binding force we spoke of before, that kind of cosmic glue which holds the atom's nucleus together. We still don't know all about that binding force yet, but we do know it is equivalent to mass. Therefore, we may speak of it as having a kind of weight of its own. Now, the two atoms into which a uranium atom splits also have binding force. But for some reason, it takes less of that glue to hold them together and in the process of fission, a tiny fraction is left over. What happens to it? It explodes as energy, proving Einstein's theory that mass and energy are really the same. But we spoke of a double miracle. To understand the second one, let's slow down that fission a million or so times. A single particle starts the reaction, splitting the uranium atom. Here now is the release of energy as heat and blast. Here are powerful rays being given off, similar to X-rays. But here, here are free neutrons driven out with tremendous speed. And provided there is sufficient U-235 present, what science calls a critical mass, those neutrons bombard other uranium atoms, causing them to split and split still others. The result, a chain reaction. Over a million, billion, billion atoms exploding within two seconds. And the force? It would take Yankee Stadium full of dynamite to equal the energy released in the complete fission of an amount of U-235 the size of a baseball. With this discovery, at the time the free world faced a war for survival, it was little wonder the first thought was a weapon. But how to obtain enough material for even a single bomb? Only a small fraction of natural uranium is the U-235 isotope which will fission in a chain reaction. And to separate enough U-235 quickly enough seemed all but impossible. But the impossible became reality as industry, labor, science, and the military combined their efforts to build Oak Ridge where enough U-235 was separated to build the first atomic bomb. At Hanford, Washington, another impossible project proved possible when a huge plant was built for the mass production of the artificial element plutonium. This process involves what may be called the furnace of atomic energy, the reactor pile. Here is a structure or pile of graphite blocks. In the reactor are placed rods of natural uranium containing both U-235 and U-238. As U-235 begins to fission, the graphite slows down the free neutrons and some of them hit other U-235 atoms, keeping the chain reaction going. But others of those slowed down neutrons hit U-238 atoms. And here's what happens. Remember, we said that U-238 wouldn't support a chain reaction. However, it will capture neutrons from U-235 fission and start a process which converts the U-238 first to neptunium, then to plutonium, 
and plutonium will fission in chain reaction. Thus, the reactor itself is a source of atomic fuel. Besides producing plutonium, the nuclear reactor makes possible two very important peacetime uses of atomic energy. Remember that the chain reaction process in the reactor creates tremendous heat, which scientists have learned how to control. Thus, a reactor may be substituted in many industrial applications where heat is now provided by coal or petroleum. But such uses in the foreseeable future are limited. For one thing, a reactor pile must be shielded to protect the workers around it from dangerous radiation. And this shielding adds tremendous weight. However, an atomic energy power plant has already proved feasible. The future supplying of electric power to entire cities is far from impossible. While nuclear power in locomotives, submarines, ships, and even very large airplanes may all but revolutionize future transportation on land, sea, and air. But perhaps the most valuable byproduct of the nation's reactor piles is radioactive isotopes. Research has revealed that many elements not naturally radioactive became so when placed in a nuclear reactor. And these isotopes, working as tracers with such measuring devices as a Geiger counter, became invisible detectives, aiding the cause of science in many different fields. In agriculture, isotopes are now used to test such things as the effect of fertilizers on plant growth and the proper timing for their use, helping to assure bigger and better yields from tomorrow's farms. In industry, isotopes have found literally hundreds of new uses, such as the automatic thickness control of sheet aluminum, saving hundreds of man hours of labor and assuring accuracy never before possible. In the fields of medicine and biochemistry, isotopes are performing near miracles of diagnosis and discovery. With radioactive sodium, doctors are solving more of the seeming mysteries of heart disease and circulatory disturbances. Radioactive phosphorus has been used to locate tumors in the brain and greatly simplify operations for their removal. Iodine-131 finds one of many uses in revealing conditions of the thyroid, and there are many more. New ways of using isotopes are being discovered constantly through the tireless work of modern pioneers in such fields as chemistry, metallurgy, medicine, and biology. Truly the superpower which man has released from within the atom's heart is not one, but many giants. One is the warrior, the destroyer. Another is the engineer seeking to provide vast quantities of energy to run the world's machines. Another is the farmer helping to better feed tomorrow's world. Still another is the healer helping to diagnose and cure the sick. And the last is the research worker working on in the fields of pure science to reveal more of the mysteries of the universe. But all are within man's power, subject to his command. On man's wisdom, on his firmness in the use of that power, depends now the future of his children and his children's children in the new world of the atomic age. I wonder if the years ahead will be as bright as this. We haven't seen anything yet, darling. Why, all this is merely a sample of the real world of tomorrow.